An interesting quote from producer engineer Mark Howard on working with Bob Dylan. He calls it passion, I call it crazy. In this clip, we talk about he and Daniel Lenoir working with Bob Dylan on Oh Mercy from 89 and Grammy winning Time Out of Mind from 1997. Mark Howard is quite a resume working with, as an engineer, mixer, producer, some of the big ones in the beginning, Bob Dylan, Time Out of Mind, as well as Oh Mercy, some Tom Waits, Neil Young, Lenoise, Marion Faithful, Emmy Lou Harris, Willie Nelson, Two for You Two, All That You Can't Leave Behind, and Ground Beneath Her Feet, Iggy Pop's in the roster. Also, Red Hot Chili Peppers, R.E.M., Tragically Hip, Ian Thornley, Ricky Lee Jones, Peter Gabriel's Us, and of course, Daniel Lenoir's solo stuff, Katie Lang, Robbie Robertson, and a host of others. Here's Mark Howard. Bob <laughs> Dylan, uh, interesting uh, stories about Bob Dylan. I, I didn't know, I mean, do you, um, when he was goofing off, and Danielle basically got mad one day, and I know you were saying that it, that happened as well uh, uh, with uh, Time Out of Mind, but you didn't share that story. What happened with that last interview? I know that what happened when he, like, what's he do? Is he just, you know, I met Gordy Howe once and I remember going and Gordy was doing fidgety noises. I was at, yeah. I used to love hockey cards and my kids loved them. We'd go to hockey shows a lot right. and, that, and our station would present a lot of hockey shows. So I met okay. Bernie Perrant, my favorite hockey player. But anyway, right. I, I, Gordy Howe was there and he was making funny noises. And the guy beside me says, well, everyone has isms as they get older he's making funny old man stories right sometimes yeah. it's not because he's a big star it's just what happens uh yeah. what was it about bob dylan like what like why would he it sounded like he was like when you were trying to mic him up there and daniel got mad is is that an ism like what do you think makes why would he do that well uh he's got a temper <laughs> and he can lose it easily and so he gets frustrated and uh, if, if he doesn't get his way he's like he really he can show it, you know, He's, he calls it passion. I call it crazy. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, Bob had come in and this was the first time we'd met Bob. And so that we didn't have any kind of like, uh, you know, know knew, knew who he was or how he worked or whatever. So he was kind this of like testing mercy, right? us. This is all this mercy. Is all mercy yeah. So he was testing, testing us in, in a, in a, you know, bizarre way. And Dan wasn't putting up with it. See, Dan is he's he's more of a cheerleader. Like it works great for you too. And he cheers Bono on. That's great. Now let's try another one. Like, yeah, really give it. And just like just trying to like get all the energy out of people and suck it out of them and stuff like that. And that didn't work for Bob. And so he didn't have that, you know, and didn't know how to get around it. Cause, you know, like when you first meet somebody, you got to learn how how to you know, learn how they work. And, you know, with me, it's always about trust. If you gain their trust, you have the license to try anything. But if they don't trust you, then it's uh, it gets very difficult and you get real kind of a lot of butting heads. And so um, I'm lucky I, I get away with it a lot that way. Uh, but with him, it was, uh, yeah, we, we Bob was just kind of like sloppily strumming and just it just flipped Dan out. It's like, that's it. And he grabs his Dobro and Bob wouldn't wear headphones. So I had like these two monitors, like on a live show, you know, in front of him, like these, e we call them EV wedges. And so Dan grabbed this thing and he goes, oh, fucking shit. And he just picks it up and slams it right on this monitor, puts a big dent in the back of this metal Dobro. And Bob like just goes, oh, fuck. And I just get up. I walk out the door. And I think if they're going to kill themselves, <laughs> I don't want to be the witness. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, I walked out, went into we had a little guest house and that was set up, you know, a little kitchenette and stuff. So I went and got a tea. And in the meantime, Bob, I heard the door open and Bob walked out. And so I went in there and there's the Dobro laying on the floor. And uh, and uh, Dan was gone. On the, and so I just closed the studio down for the night. And then the next day, it was like nothing happened. Bob comes in. He's a little more kind of like respective because for the first two weeks of that record, he never said my name, didn't even acknowledge I was in the room. And so he was playing his kind of like cards, you know, to see, you know, what's going to happen kind of thing. So uh, but then we hit we hit it off with motorcycles. And so ever since then, it's like that was the first time he said, hey, Mark. Can you get me one of those? It was like, oh, okay, you know who I am now. <laughs> you know, not just like this guy floating around. Yeah. Yeah. For the it, he was being a little cheeky in the beginning, just with, you know, I put the microphone in front of him and then he'd turn over here. I put the microphone over here and he'd go back over here. 
And then he'd get up and then he'd go into the piano room and he'd be playing on the piano. And uh, I'd move the whole drum set into that room. And then he'd get up off the piano, come back into the kitchen where the studio was. And I'd bring the whole drum set back. And it was like chasing him around. <laughs> it was, it was you were getting bit. your cardio. Yeah, yeah. And we had three grand pianos in in uh, uh, um, the recording room. It was really the living room, but it was a you know, high ceilings, beautiful ornate and stuff. And so uh, he kept on going. We had a 19, uh, 1800 Steinway and uh, C, like a B series. And then we had a, um, a Steinway, a newer one, a 1980s Steinway that they used at the Jazz Fest for uh, stage and stuff like that. And then we had this old Baldwin kind of uh, eight foot um, grand. And so uh, Dan got up the nerve one day because Bob kept on going to the to the Baldwin to to try, you know, uh, his songs out. Um, and uh, and so he asked Bob, he goes, Bob, like, I'm thinking about buying one of these pianos. They've loaned them to us. And uh, and I was just curious, like, um, why do you keep coming to the Baldwin piano? Like, is it something like in the in the action? Or is it something that you really like about it? And, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, and Bob turns around to him and looks at him in the eye and goes, nah, it's the only one with a stool or a, a seat, you know, like so the other pianos. And so he didn't want to move it. So he just kept going to the one where this he could sit down and play. So it was pretty crazy. From your perspective, what, what, what do you think from from being there? We'll talk about time out of mind in a second. But what, what to you makes him great? I mean, the, I mean, this is like a a, 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 a Captain Obvious question. But yeah. for you personally, what, what what do you think it is that 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 he plugged into so many different g- generations and right? Well, I think uh, you know my whole thing is about lyrics, so uh, I like to listen to songs that create images in my mind. You know, like that you take you on a voyage. He's a master of that, and to see what he does and how he does it is a pretty amazing education in itself. You know, it's like that was my English education working on those records because I would have to write down the the lyrics and so because he was going to give us the lyrics. So in my workbook, I would write the first word and last word of each verse. And every time he listened, I'd fill it in, you know. And so every now and again, he'd come over and look at my book and to see what, what verses he had and whatever stuff like that. So we'd always be going over lines like that. But he's amazing at, at um, kind of like uh, being able to take the listener and uh, kind of like give them, uh, you have to really listen into it. And that's why, you know, he, he got kind of put on this pedestal because people were thinking in the early days that, you know, he's like uh, times are changing and, you know, that whole thing. And he, he wrote that 10 years before all that stuff happened. That had nothing to do with this kind of thing. So, and so uh, he's he's really great at kind of self-editing and just kind of like coming up and he'll do two two different kind of like takes of the song and change his lyrics around just to see how they feel. And then he'll change the key to see if his voice sounds better in a higher key or lower key. So every take has got kind of the, all these kind of searching things, which I learning early on, you know, that helps me with my production and helping people and, and stuff like that. And so, but he is an amazing lyricist and you, you can't deny it. It's like, he's one of the best I've ever seen. Bob Dylan saw that I had one motorcycle outside of the studio and, he came up to me. He goes, "Mark, can you can you get me one of those?" I said, "Yeah." And so, you know, I got him this beautiful 1966 Harley Davidson shovelhead, first year of the shovelhead, classic bike, uh, electric glide, uh, kind of like electric blue color, like really incredible. So he came early into the studio. Once I brought it back, he, I had to go to Florida to pick it up on the weekend while we weren't working. And so I he brought it. I brought it back and. He takes it out, and I go with him with my bike, and I said, "Go, follow me, where I'll and I'll show you how to get to the uh, to the levee." And so, and we just drive along the top of the levee with the Mississippi on one side, and then that kind of cuts down, and you go over this bridge, and then you go through all these like trees that look like a um, uh, tunnel, and it's like with the moss hanging down. It was like really incredible with big antimel mansions on all over the place. And so I told him how to get out of town. And, and then, so then he started taking rides by himself. And so I think that uh, opened up a lot of things because motorcycle riding 
it, it's a time to think and, you know, all your ideas because, you know, it's just kind of like a place where you go. To but he didn't wear a helmet. He wouldn't wear a helmet. Well, he, he I told him it was helmet, but he never did. And he'd come back sometimes because the police are so friendly around here. They keep waving at me. I go, they're waving at you. You don't have a helmet on. And so, yeah, so it was uh, crazy events. That, and so that's what uh, Listen Up, the book is about, all these kind of crazy stories that are kind of behind the curtain that nobody knows about. I talked to Mark Howard for two hours. We had a great conversation. I didn't want it to end. He was such an interesting chap. We'll have more from Mark on his days of and or producing, engineering, mixing in the next couple of days. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.